The bed is still cold from the broken window, and not too inviting. But it's yours. You've earned it. It's not easy, but your bones are so tired from what feel like weeks of work on the case. You have to try. After what feels like hours, you feel you might be sleeping. Thoughts, baby. A million little lights in the dark. You're one fine instrument, brother. All those faces and all those names. All that laughter and screaming and scheming around. Every corner and every street. Recorded in you forever on Ferratay. No, you're spinning tapes at the discotheque. The great unceasing disco of the mind. The flash. The bang. The endless learning experience. On and on it goes. For untold hours. At the disco where you first asked her to dance. Rising. Rising above the dark curvature, the great wingspan of sleep, studded with stars. Behold, there are millions of them down there. The first time, the last time, the smoke in her mouth, the plotted flowers, the faces. Turning, changing. It's the world, Harry boy, and you're made of it. Every day you're out there, you make more of yourself from it. I'm afraid you can't be unmade now. You can never forget this shit. Beautiful. It's stuck on loop, whirling, spitting out words and images. You're the son of the world again. Harrister, a ceaseless agent. Picking up litter and old newspapers. Collecting your little bubblegum wrappers and idiotic picture postcards. Meaningless, meaningless keepsake. Reading your awful letters and recalling things, aren't you? This book you are. The map of a city. You'll go insane if you keep going like this. One more day, and you'll be in the loony bin. I just know you will. And for what, brother man? For the working class. Solving your little crossword puzzles. Doing your tasks, crossing names off lists, trying to become some sort of world detector. It won't make it okay. It won't put smoke back in her mouth. He's got no idea what he's in for. It's ringing, Harry. The disco circus goes on and on. You barely slept three hours last night. You can do it. It's nothing. Do it for the city. Go.
Rise and shine, comrade. It's time to get to work. Despite all the thinking you've been doing, only 0.0001% of communism has been built. It's too great a task to undertake alone. You're going to have to get organized. Uh-oh. Organization hasn't exactly been your strong suit, historically speaking. Your level of personal upkeep is irrelevant. All that matters is your commitment to building the World Republic. You must seek out your revolutionary brothers and sisters. Find out how much communism they've built. Then, together, maybe you'll be able to build as much as 0.0002% of communism. But it won't be easy. Decades of persecution by coalition authorities have driven the remaining communists of Martinez underground. They live underground. These communists aren't men. They're mole people. Just between us, you may want to lay off this grind up the bourgeoisie stuff. It's a bit off-putting, even to fellow communists. Possibly. If you have been, it's only because you're a double agent, acting in furtherance of your long-term objectives. Regardless, what's past is past. You need to look forward to the work of building communism for all. They're not mole people. They're your comrades in the eternal class struggle. It's your task to find and join them. Let your nose guide you, detective. No, we meant your nose, as in that swollen muck detector in the center of your face. It just happens to be perfectly calibrated for sensing communists. We really have no idea what they're talking about. There's no linkage between ideology and olfaction. Failure. That's why you're perfect for the job. No one's got a better nose for failure than you, detective. What you're smelling is your own body odor, of course. Nothing a shower and change of clothes couldn't fix. People sometimes complain there are no real communists left in Martinez. But you can smell their presence. They're out there, waiting for you to join them. First, you'll have to locate the remaining communists in Martinez. When you get near to someone with revolutionary potential, your nose will give you the signal to establish contact. Again, no, it won't. Any olfactory response you perceive will be strictly psychosomatic. You should begin by interrogating those lawless malcontents at the Dock Workers Union. They're an obvious place to start. You'll discuss the monumental world historical task that lies before you. You'll engage in rigorous and spirited debates about Mazovian theory and practice. But mostly, you'll probably complain about other communists. Not at all. Complaining about other communists is one of the most important parts of being a communist. Here we go. Wake, brave worker. Tis no time for bed. Fight till there's no slaves below and no masters overhead. There, do you smell that? Can you not detect that inimitable whiff of dissatisfaction and restlessness, that sense that the world is in need of dramatic, even violent reordering? Can you smell it now? No, actually. In fact, you can't smell much of anything. Perhaps your allergies are acting up. Nonsense. The reek of communism is unmistakable, and it's coming from that railing over there. Yes, now's your chance to establish contact. Scab? Good one, officer. 
Don't worry, we here have solidarity with the RCM. Imagine, you cops going on a strike, but then another cop comes in and says, let us cop for less money. <laughs> Speaking of, what brings the RCM here, to the wild north? Come to see the strife? What's that, boy? Yeah? Now's your chance. Remember, communists are notoriously skittish, so it's best to insinuate your way in. Could be coming from one of the jam lorries? Cargo's been sitting out for a while. Hmm. You might have to look elsewhere for help with that. Okay, maybe it's time to abandon the subtle approach. Comunistas, huh? Can't say that's where I thought you were heading with this. Not that I'm criticizing. It's good for a man to take his time and think about the whole socio-political world picture. It's certainly been an interesting development to witness first time. So you've given up copying and now you're hunting comunistas. Care to say why? A fellow plains roamer in search of greater understanding. A classic story. I wish I could help. Unfortunately, I don't know many comunistas. Some are. Some aren't. It's a big institution, room for all kinds. Comunistas, semi supremacists, even an anti-institutional boyadero. There is warmth in his voice when he talks about the Union. Whatever his personal politics, this is his home. All right, so if he isn't personally a communist, he's definitely hanging out with them. Ah, but you know, I did meet a genuine ideologo a few months ago. Perhaps he is your guy. You know, a guy with a theory. Someone who likes to pit his theory against other theories in deadly theory combat. It was late one night as I was leaving the arbor. He was waiting on the corner in a bright white jacket. Classic Saramiritian style. He asked me for a light. We shared cigarettes. Then he asked me if I ever thought about getting into some of the extra physical branches of communism. No idea. I took it to mean he was asking me to join some sort of underground cell. A very old school organizing technique. The sort of thing communistas used to do before the revolution. It was all right. A little like something out of a vespertine spy novel, but I must respect the effort. I couldn't tell you. Once I declined his offer, we finished our cigarettes and he disappeared back into the night. Just before he melted into the shadows, he turned to me and said, Remember Dobrava and Abba Danais. And then he was gone. I don't know. Guess not everyone remembers. Been wondering about that myself. Some communista inside talk could be. Not meant for the wider public. They love that kind of thing. You'd have to ask someone who knows to see the logo personally. I have to say, though, it sounds like you found yourselves a proper hunt. The man whispers a jaunty tune. A coastal breeze ruffles his hair. There it is again. There's a spectral scent haunting this pair, no doubt. And it smells like years of turmoil, of hopes and dreams, ground beneath the inexorable tides of capital. What do you smell? Nothing. Or at least nothing in particular. As far as you're concerned, your nose seems to be purely decorative. Absolute rubbish. Your politico olfactory cortex doesn't deceive you. The smell is coming from that balcony over there. Zertenemo, a precocious communist youth, a symbol of a kinder, more hopeful future. Now's your chance to establish contact with your revolutionary brothers and sisters. A chance to establish contact with the future. What a beautiful, terrible thought.
The streets will flow red once more. A great torrent rushing down Rue de Esperance. You wait and see. The streets will not flow red with anything. Who are you? I'm Cindy the fucking Skull. What else do you want to know? Date of birth, blood type, the last time I was tested for hep C. Had a battery of tests just last week. I'm practically a patchwork of interesting critters. Kind of like a man o' war. She's grown frustrated with her work and welcomes the opportunity to challenge authority in other ways. And what do you know about politics? An underground cell. My, my. Sounds big time. Sure. I know someone who'd love to talk that ideological stuff. You're looking for Stiban, a right communist who runs a mega cool and very secret meeting. He might. No. <sighs> a wicked grin extends across her face. A laughing skull, death hilarious. This is gonna be bad. Oink for me, piggy. Just once. Wow, that was easier than I expected. It's almost like you've been wanting to do it this whole time. A cool, damp feeling ripples through you. You realize you needn't have rolled over quite so easily. The lieutenant, needless to say, is not impressed. Sounds like you're really serious about meeting Stepan. It's touching, sort of. Stepan's group meets only at night, in an old room in these apartments here. It just so happens you're in luck. Their weekly meeting is tonight. Poke your snout around sometime after 10 p.m. and you might just find them. Use your little piggy brain! I'm sure someone will let you in. But it won't be this one. Just that he's a real communist. Not like the play acting you've been doing. The rest, you'll have to see for yourself. Oh, smart pig. Because there is... See, Stepan's a bit on the paranoid side. He's got all these mega secret passphrases to keep out infiltrators and the like. You can't join the meeting without one. <clears throat> Not to interfere in your personal errand, but I wonder whether it might have something to do with that phrase Manana mentioned overhearing. Of course you were, detective. Apologies for interrupting. No, you weren't. Otherwise, you would have said it. In truth, it was quite beyond your associative powers. Guess this is what happens when two pigs put their heads together. That's enough. Off with you then. Watch your back, Ungulate. You've got eyes on you. Don't be distracted by the flattery and funny man act. 
Stop. Oh, an investment? I guess it can't be any risk. But officer, ten real is a bargain for. Shelf. I would say, uh, the book is also very dead. So you feel like you should get this one. A true cultural touchstone. This bookstore is not strictly about. Huh. I can't have Amidst these, the point of the book and men, it serves play wholeness when it's up to your mind to heal yourself. The book, this even, this is just mundane garbage. What's even paranatural about this? The throbbing suddenly, as if out of nowhere. The book contains very, the book con for example, it recommends it is and good. It also rec among other benefits, it is alleged to restore a damage for general health. These strolls, this is exactly there's an entire section devoted to cures. Excuse me, sir. I believe you've been indeed. Something about that well, I hope it can take The greatest browsing your educational so that's the spirit. Here we go. Question incorrect. Her color steer clear. A strange yes, the quiz is incorrect. As the f question easy. Everybody know correct. Franco question three. Who was the false? Correct. The most famous final stretch. You've come so far. And correct. Everything. Congratulate a B. You would have better if you just huh? Take what? Uh-huh. You are really just talking to yourself. Man, something's weird about this book! Browsing your educational survey is done. It seems rather unfair to try again after you already know the correct. As the question easy. Every correct. Franco Negro. Question three. Who? Correct. The most final stretch. You've come so far. Correct. Everything. Congrat and A. You really navigated some treacherous war. The lieutenant. Yeah, sure. It's so Medicinal perp. Flipping through the book. You come across. Finally. It seems to contain descriptions of the medicine. There are a number of co -like tonics. What you're describing is b There's nothing in here that speaks to First, you need to Next. You need to combine the basing. Lastly, is that the ginger root will help. The very thought of this tea causes your muscles to relax. A tingle rushes down your spine, and you feel your toes uncurl. Flipping through the book, you find. Have you taken any walks through the pal recently? The book is frustratingly vague on this topic, but it, flipping through the book, you find a number. Have you taken any walk? And on your walks? Good. And when you meditate, excellent. You're doing everything as you should. A note of caution, however. Be sure to live very well. Next, you need to... Lastly, is the ginger root you imagine yourself. Several... The maps look old. This slot is on. In the northeast, you can. Lost. The ocean connection you have lived. Perhaps they are. The north cut to the east. Kudon. You feel your... It's not... Still, it's detailed. Shelves filled to the with crime. Crime fiction. These books. What's not a single mention? You see, a killing is declared. 
Dick Mullen in the Yes, tragedy. Come on. Come on. Again? The fuck? Gosh, what? A very f Yeah, sure. After all this. <laughs> the display rack is brimming with worn pet rows and rows of here. Maybe a not even close. Man from Hyondal in hell. Man from Hyondal. A twinge at the back of your head makes you flip. Your hand reaches lock between the throne and the Hyondal man lays the entire oh. The display rack before you is burnt. Not looking for there's I don't want Don't let him Is it alright but make it my name That's No Ask him again I'd even We will Oh no not And when last week You did it <sighs> It was my Makes sense He doesn't re And I But he hasn't left yet No Now if you'll excuse me I really need This for I But it's a Good luck with the investigation He's gone. No point in running. He could be. He did. If we find a way in. A stone. There's a key. This will just have. This door has been no reply. It's a solid lump of metal, but... You seem committed to it, so go on. The shackle... After The cup. Honestly, he. The white star, the photos on the wall. I think. Hold on a second. Is this why you broke in here? To find out whether you're cra. Sure you are. Well, you both do seem to share an affinity for sideburns. But it seems like. Ah. <sighs> doesn't he have a birthmark right here? What about you? Alright. But here's the big thing. Krasmas of looks. Okay. You why are you so hell-bent on proving that you're Krasmazov, anyway? I think you have misunderstood who he was, but... Whoever lives here definitely sh- There aren't many communists around. As you approach the metal grill, you can hear several voices having what appears to be an animated discussion. This must be it. B 
Beyond this door lies the beaten heart of radical communism in Martinez. Somehow, the night air softens the smell of trash and sea brine. As the breeze pulls through the canvas like a shuttle through a loom, you catch a hint of something unexpected, something earthy, warm, and burnt. The acrid smell of failure. No, that's just slightly burnt coffee. A smell you would recognize anywhere. Just look at these pigs sniffing about after hours. Go ahead and arrest me, officer. I swear I'll go peacefully. The metal grill is cool to the touch. You notice the lieutenant is looking uncustomarily anxious. His posture is rigid. His right hand hovers near the zipper of his jacket. Something's not right here. The equation doesn't quite balance. Which is just to say, we should be prepared for any eventuality. You can make out at least two separate voices. The voices are male, you think. Beyond that, you can't tell. The clang of metal reverberates all along the scaffolding. The voices coming from the other side fall silent. Who's there? Is that you, Morris? Who said communist? Did we say communist? Get out of here. For a moment, silence. What's the passphrase? There's no response. You begin to wonder whether they've slipped out some back way. No, they're still there. You can feel them back there. All right. The key stayed to the back of the door frame. Just make sure you put it back when you're done, or we'll all be locked out. And do wash the concrete. It just kind of falls away, in places. Charmant. After you, detective. Have fun at your underground meeting, pig. Hope it's a blast. The two young men are either oblivious to or ignoring your entrance. Their attentions are fixed on whatever it is they're stacking in the middle of the floor. Matchboxes, it appears. I think he's holding, Alexis. It is. It's holding. Careful, careful. Damn, hardly any difference. You two, you are late. They should know the meeting starts at 10 p.m. sharp. One leader and one follower. The most ancient power dynamic. Are you saying you haven't done the reading for tonight? Uh-oh. No one said anything about reading. You'll just have to wing this one. No, detective. The only reading I've been doing is right here. He seems to be wagging the notebook at you as though he suspects you may have forgotten why you're here. I have not had time to seek out pretentious communist book clubs, nor have I done their reading. It doesn't sound like they've done the reading, Staban. Well, this is getting awkward. I'm not sure what you're expecting to find here, then. There's profound consternation in his voice. You suspect it's about something bigger than you're not having done the reading. Maybe they can explain themselves. In the most generous sense, I would say we're cultivating revolutionary consciousness. Yes, that's probably the best way to describe it. But more specifically, we are running a reading group. The most rigorous and theoretically advanced materialist reading group in Martinez. Comrade Steban is a great discussion leader. One of the best at the university. We have been known to get into some spirited debates but it's always in service of our larger intellectual and ideological project. Precisely. We are not interested in senseless parroting. We like to read critically. 
Within the contours of Mazovian historical materialism, of course. Huh, as though you can call that problem teaching. One thing you learn quickly at university is that you're not going to find a real education in any lecture hall or discussion seminar. We are post-attendants, basically. Exactly. The only worthwhile part of the so-called École Normale de Revachol is the library. That's where we've made our greatest critical strides. We study all the foundational texts of Mazovian theory, of course. Just last week, we finished the second volume of Puncher and Watman's Innocence of Capital. Truly extraordinary. And before that, we spent six weeks on state and plasm. Uh-oh. You can feel your attention span rapidly deteriorating. We've also read Wert Müller's The Mega Structure of History, and before that, Real and Reality. Communist theorists love puns, in case that wasn't obvious. Ablars in pain fernal. The original Fisdale translation, not that worked down revisionist garbage. Obviously. <laughs> but, of course. Our special emphasis is on the theories of Ignaz Nilsson and his followers, especially the inframaterialists. You're not familiar with him? It's pretty advanced stuff. You may not be ready for it yet, gendarme. Only Krasmazov's most trusty lieutenant, the evangelist of the revolution, and the founding father of the People's Republic of Samara, it's hard to overstate how unimpressed he is that you've never heard of this world historical individual. He also happens to be the greatest communist theorist after Mazov himself. It was Nielsen who first postulated the existence of ideological plasm, which forms the basis of inframaterialist theory. The young man sighs. His companion looks about furtively. Clinching. No, we're not an operational cell. We think of ourselves as more of an intellectual vanguard. Our stance? What? Do you want to know if the SRV has established a party line on the lynchings in Martinez? Though historically speaking, the SRV has supported direct action against right-wing paramilitary squads, especially when they are doing the Indotribe's dirty work. Good point. So as a provisional matter, I can say we support it. Are they being sarcastic? You feel like you're caught in some elaborate joke labyrinth, but it's impossible to see your way through. It's always that way. Beneath the crust of irony, there's a molten sincerity that threatens to erupt forth. You may witness it yet. No, we're an independent organization. We acknowledge and respect the Union's efforts, but our interests are more theoretical than Mr. Clare's. That's easy. Crime is simply the inevitable expression of the injustice and incoherence embedded within capitalism itself. It's a symptom, in other words, not a cause. His companion can barely suppress a yawn. No, unfortunately. The communards were hunted down and killed nearly to a man. All that's left of them are bones and old rifles. It's a world historical nightmare, one from which we've yet to awaken. When will you wake up? And what will you see when you do? A moment of silence. They're waiting for you to speak. What do you mean? This is the reading room. We're in something of a rebuilding phase. Some of our former comrades didn't have the ideological fortitude our work demands. Intellectual attrition is maybe the best way to describe it. Felix said he couldn't keep up with the reading on top of his classwork. And Zuzana wanted to read texts other than Mazovian theory. Like novels, if you can believe it. Imagine the audacity of wanting to read a novel in a reading group. See? 
Even the gendarme gets it. We've tried recruiting new members, but unfortunately the current intellectual climate is pretty hostile to inframaterialist thought. These days, if you're on the left, the ascendant schools are the Godwalians and their Econoclarns. Don't forget about Maurice and the turnips. <laughs> right. Then there is the whole turnip debacle. Whatever this turnip business is about, one thing is perfectly clear. These young students have a much deeper understanding of communism than you do. You could learn a thing or two from them. If you can convince them, you're one of them. They're the most depressing school of communism. They love writing long books with a patina of Mazovian theory to cover up their cheap psychologizing. A gang of cheap psychologists and intellectual midgets. <laughs> Typical God Wallace, in other words. It's okay for Uli to say that because his dad is from Gottwald. The Gottwald school believe that intellectuals as a class are incapable of sparking revolutionary change. So all they can do is critique capitalism from inside itself. That's why they spend all their time smoking cigarettes and writing long works of criticism that make you want to commit suicide. It is miserable. That's probably why they're always committing suicide. You see, the Gottwald school look like communists. They talk like communists. But scratch the patina and you'll see beneath that they're just depressed liberals who've read too many books. For starters, they love talking about beans. That's right. Econoclards are obsessed with beans. They love thinking about beans. They love counting beans. But most of all, they love building models to predict how many beans there'll be in the future. They're by far the most bean-centric school of communism. Ah yes, the much maligned bean counters, ensconced in their think tanks and high-rises, believing they can save the world through a series of incremental, assiduously technocratic reforms. See? You're already falling for that scarcity logic. You start off assuming there aren't enough beans to go around. So naturally you want to cut the bean rations in half. And next thing you know, there are budget cuts, so now we've got to cut the bean rations in half again. You see, iconoclars claim to be communists, but in reality they're just liberals with hard-ons for spreadsheets. Of course not. The only people who actually call themselves liberals are mouth-foaming reactionaries. Basically indistinguishable from fascists. You need an X-ray machine to tell the difference. Cindy is... How to describe her role? Something of an ideological auxiliary, perhaps. Yes, that's exactly how I would put it. And naturally, we support her radical counter-liberal aesthetics. But she refuses to submit an essay, so we can't call her a member of the group per se. That doesn't stop her from using the room for studio space, of course. Ah, <sighs> it's an unfortunate story. You see, our ex-comrade Maurice is something of an economist. He's studying macro and microeconomics. Well, wow, a real intellectual, it sounds like. Right. So a few weeks ago we were discussing the extra physical capabilities of the revolutionary state. And Maurice said... What were his exact words, Ulexis? It was unbelievable. He said, Turnips don't care if they are grown by communists, moralists or Vulcan. They grow just the same. Basically, he was rejecting the whole foundation of inframaterialist theory. Simply that under suitably revolutionary conditions, crop yields naturally increase relative to non-revolutionary crops, which Morris somehow has the goal to deny. Susanna said that he has been hanging out with some non-communists lately. For us, the question boiled down to if you don't even accept the basic ideas of Nielsen and inframaterialist theory, why are you in the reading group? Of course you do. It's pretty basic stuff. Well, it wasn't so much that he was expelled. He just quit coming. We haven't seen him around for weeks. Go ahead. 
The young man frowns at the little pile of boxes on the floor. Nothing, just messing around until the meeting started. They're watching those matchboxes awfully intently for two guys who are just messing around. It's almost as though they were trying to create the most unstable structure they could. We typically only accept new members once per semester. There's this whole process with essays and presentations on assigned topics. But given that we have some extra seating at the moment, I guess we could be convinced to expedite an application or two. Stepan, you can't be serious. For these gendarmes? I am serious. As materialists, we've got to adapt to conditions as they are. Besides, he'll still need to pass the interview portion of the entrance process. Assuming he's even still interested, that is. Sure, we're here most every night. Maybe we'll catch you again. Sleep well, gendarme. The gendarme returns. What's there to be scared of? You've really been cracking the books these last few days. You can go toe to intellectual toe with any reading group in Martinez. Now, chin up. You've got this. Oh, you want to start now? Sure, we can manage that. You've caught him off balance. The momentum is already in your favor. Go ahead and take a seat. Since we haven't had time to prepare an exhaust questionnaire, I think we can keep this interview more freeform. Why don't you tell us a bit about the books you're interested in, and we'll just see where the conversation goes. Aha, a real old-school pedestrian materialist. All right, we'll play along. So what sort of practical works are we talking about? Interesting. I always thought that stuff was common folk superstitions. We packaged as bourgeois spiritualism. Maybe I've been overly dismissive. This is a good start. They're starting to loosen up. You feel relaxed and in control. Soon, you're debating whether a decommodified spirituality is even possible under capitalism. Probably not is the answer, which isn't to say it isn't sometimes still useful. Ogotwalian will tell you that it's an inescapable fact of modernity, that we can only repackage our collective history in increasingly ludicrous forms. Thank God we are no Ogotwalians. These kids are eating out of your hand, practically. Another quarter of an hour disappears. The questions come rapid fire, but you have an answer for every one. Now you can sense things starting to slow down. The interview must be reaching an inflection point. Don't you think, though, that you can only really understand current events if you have a firm background in history and political theory? Hmm. Don't think I'm familiar with it. Give us a quick summary, if you don't mind. Now's your chance to end this interview on a high note. You quickly gloss Lopez de Fuego's essential argument, peppering it with your own commentary and asides. Like a river emptying into the sea, the discussion winds its way toward the character of the innocence herself. But then, any critical account of Dolores Day's reign has to seriously reckon with her atrocities in Margaritania and La Vuelta during the Mesk secession, don't you think? Total nonsense. The greatest thing Dolores Day ever did was get blasted by her own therrier. If he wants a real critical history, he's got to read on the material conditions of the Mirovan boilermakers. He's so good. Brutally revelatory. In any case, I think we've heard enough. We could use someone with your perspective in a group, with just a bit more theoretical foundation. I think you'll be making real contributions. Yes, 
I would say he's got serious potential at least. And with that, welcome to the most ideologically advanced materialist reading group in Martinez. Here's your first assignment. It's an overview of inframaterialist theory. A little basic, as you'll see, but one has to start somewhere. You're going to fit right in, I think. Come back when you're done. We'll be here pretty much every night after 10 p.m. Do be sure to take your time with the reading. We'll be eager to hear your thoughts. The cover of this pocket-sized volume features a swirl of orange, yellow, and green. The title, A Brief Look at Inframaterialism, is set in an authoritative yet approachable serif font. What an interesting color palette. It's vibrant, yet somehow leaves you ever so slightly nauseated. On the inside jacket flap, you find a brief summary. What is inframaterialism? A highly theoretical branch of Mazovian communism? A collection of mystical ramblings by a discredited revolutionary? Or possibly both? This brief look, TM, introduces readers to one of this century's most fascinating and misunderstood theories in a concise, jargon-free manner. The back of the book contains four or five pages of primary and secondary sources, but you'd need access to a university library to find most of them. In other words, this guide is the only source you're likely to find. You turn to the table of contents, the guide itself is divided into several sections with seemingly esoteric titles like Effects of Plasm on Root Vegetables and Mental Projection and Transference. There's also a brief introduction about the life of Ignis Nielsen. Known to his numerous admirers as the Evangelist of the Revolution and to his even more numerous enemies as the Apocalyptic Shrike, Ignis Nielsen remains one of the most controversial and fascinating figures to emerge in the years of the anti-Centennial Revolution, second only to Krasmazov himself. During his unparalleled life, he helped guide a revolution in one country and found a new state in another. Along the way, he committed some of the most notorious war crimes in an era famed for its atrocities. And yet, his most fascinating contribution to history may be the most overlooked. His theory of ideological plasm from which his followers and successors developed the school of communism known as inframaterialism. If you're like most people, you probably believe that your thoughts reside in your brain, right? That's not right at all. Thoughts don't exist in the brain. They float through the air. Your brain is but a fish swimming through them. This sounds more like a question for a psychiatrist. See also a brief look at psychiatry. But let's stick with Ignis Nielsen a moment. As Mazov's devoted comrade and leading theoretician, Nielsen was responsible for developing much of the intellectual foundation of communism. But his interests and speculations were famously wide-ranging. During his final years in exile, he produced, among other things, an early guide to home brewing, instructions for raising revolutionary children, plans for a universal pictographic language, and a detailed materialist critique of Dolores Day's chess strategy. A true man of ideas, equal to any of the great DeLorean polymaths. But one subject he returned to time and time again was the fundamental relationship between thoughts and matter. We may yet discover, he wrote in his notebooks, that under certain exceptional circumstances, the proletariat's embrace of historical materialism may be so fervent that their beliefs take form in the world of matter as a kind of revolutionary plasm. Certainly, in essence, Nielsen is arguing that thoughts don't just reside inside the brain, they radiate outward from it. According to this idea, the brain is an ideological transponder, constantly emitting waves of highly politicized energy, which Nielsen called 
Plasm. Whoa is right. What's more, Nielsen speculated that this plasm, when it becomes powerful enough, might begin to influence the material reality surrounding it. Hence the name, Inframaterialism. Unfortunately, Nielsen passed away before he was able to develop these initial ideas into a full-fledged theory. That work was left to subsequent generations of communist theorists. Building on Nielsen's basic insight, these theorists reached a startling conclusion that a sufficiently revolutionary state might begin to exhibit certain extra-physical effects based on the amount of plasm generated by its citizens. The actual theory is highly technical, but for the purposes of this brief look, TM, that's a fine working definition of the concept. That's because this is absolute idiocy, not even worth engaging with. No, no, no. There's something here. You can feel it. Inframaterialists divide the extra-physical effects of the revolutionary state by the level of plasm required to achieve them. At the lowest, or first level, revolutionary plasm is believed to stimulate or invigorate matter without altering its essential properties. To take one example, during the revolutionary period, many communard farmers in Grad reported extraordinary yields of certain root vegetables, most notably turnips. The difference in these yields was simply too great to be accounted for by mere climate or soil conditions. The only reasonable explanation, inframaterialists argue, is the high level of revolutionary plasm emanating from the commune itself. Even today, in parts of the SRV, there are collective farms whose root vegetable yields exceed those thought possible by capitalist agronomists. Who's to say the farmers aren't just cooking the books? Sounds like obvious SRV propaganda. It's also been postulated that plasm may account for the remarkably full and manly facial hair observed on many communist males. Of course, inframaterialists argue that revolutionary plasm may stimulate human physiology in other ways as well. In fact, reports from the revolutionary period claim that the most radically devoted communards were able to engage in vigorous intercourse for up to eight hours at a time. Eight hours? There's no way. Your equipment would be mashed to jelly. Hyperproductive vegetables and ultra-horny communards are fine. But this theory hasn't quite gotten strange enough for you. And on that note, you feel like you've gotten the general idea of inframaterialism. Enough to carry on a basic conversation, at least. But... If you'd like to go even deeper into some of the more speculative aspects of the theory, you could always read further. Of course you want to go deeper. What else are you here for? The book fits quite snugly into your palm. It would also fit comfortably into a jacket pocket. You flip forward a few pages until you come upon a chapter titled Mental Projection and Transference. When a community has achieved a sufficiently high degree of revolutionary fervor, inframaterialists believe that second-level effects may be observed. At this second level, certain hyper-revolutionary individuals may even develop the ability to extend their thoughts into material space and vice versa. According to inframaterialist theory, yes, under suitably revolutionary conditions, that is. Of course, one doesn't need to be a communist to be attuned to the thoughts of your brothers and sisters. It's become something of a folk legend that during their final meeting, Nielsen and Mazov didn't speak a single word, preferring to sit in silence with their chamomile tea, reading one another's thoughts. One of the minor tragedies of the late revolutionary period is that few reliable accounts survive. Much of what we know of the communards activities during this period come from memoirs and second-hand accounts, some only written down decades after the fact and 
of dubious authenticity. If by special you mean marred by extreme dysfunction, then yes, I suppose it is pretty special. Your words hang in the air as the lieutenant scribbles something in his notebook. At some point, he realizes you're waiting for him and looks up with a tightly knit brow. The lieutenant looks at you evenly for a moment, then returns to his notebook without a word. Did I? My bad, detective. Won't happen again. As we were saying, it's generally believed that these effects are only exhibited by certain hyper-revolutionary individuals. Generally, less than 0.01% of the revolutionary population. Because plasm has never been directly observed, the exact mechanism behind these effects remains entirely speculative. Why are you getting hung up on mechanisms? Open your mind's aperture just a little wider. You're so close to true understanding. This should be more than enough for a stimulating discussion. That said, if you're still yearning for more, you must. Everyone knows. Books save their best parts for the end. You breeze through the next several sections until you arrive at the final chapter, titled A Communism Above Reality. When a society's revolutionary fervor reaches the third and highest level, Inframaterialist theoreticians have postulated that the laws of physics cease to be laws. More like suggestions, according to some of the SRV's leading inframaterialists. Of course, it's impossible to say what exactly happens under these conditions. No known society has ever achieved the levels of revolutionary enthusiasm the theory seems to require. Some inframaterialists have even argued that it might require more plasm than humanity alone may be capable of producing. There are numerous stories from Samara involving bandits or fascist mercenaries being levitated by farmers from the most ideologically advanced communes. Of course, few of these incidents have ever been rigorously investigated or substantiated. Among known attempts to channel third-level capabilities the most well-documented is the curious case of Coalition Warship Debutante. It concerns an interesting series of events that took place during the invasion of Revachol. As Coalition forces made landfall, a cadre of Nielsen's most fervent acolytes attempted to compress a Coalition aerostatic with their collective will. According to Communard law, these acolytes positioned themselves at the top of a redoubt just over the bay of Revachol. From that vantage, they proceeded to visualize pinching coalition warship debutante between their fingers, a gesture believed to assist in the extra-physical materialization of their thoughts. The acolytes, along with the redoubt, were vaporized in an artillery strike before the process could be completed. It's been said, though, that in the weeks following the battle, the captain of the debutante noted an increase in incidents of crewmen striking their heads on unexpectedly low bulkheads. Of course, colorful anecdotes only scratch the surface of what inframaterialists believe may be possible in a truly third-level society. In the SRV, there have been attempts to organize certain species of aquatic mammals as well as a few of the higher corvids. But, as of this writing, only human beings have demonstrated the intellectual capacity for revolutionary communism. Some have theorized that such a society would be fundamentally unrecognizable, lacking many of the institutions we typically take for granted in advanced societies, including organized governments, financial institutions, and law enforcement. Uh, did that book just say there's no place for you in this future? This sounds like a seditious fantasy. How can they allow books like this in print? Others have argued that people living under third-level conditions will be immune to such infirmities as hunger, disease, and mental illness. In some of his later writings, Nielsen himself 
speculated about the potential for an extra-physical architecture that disregards the laws of bourgeois physics and, instead, relies on the revolutionary faith of the people for structural integrity. Precisely, Nielsen observed that the financial system operates on the same principle of faith. So why not an architectural system? On the following page, you come across a few black and white reproductions from Nielsen's own notebooks. One sketch depicts a government ministry shaped like a great inverted pyramid. A hectare in width at the top, balanced atop foundations the size of common apartments. Another depicts a leaning tower wrapped in a dramatic helix. The caption beneath it reads, The Tower of History. In the corner of one of the reproduced notebook pages, you can make out the following words, written in Nielsen's distinctive slashing script. A state that has lost the faith of its people has forfeited the right to exist. There is no more. You've reached the outer theoretical limits of communism and in less than 200 pages. If you'd like to read further, may we recommend a brief look at Occidental Architecture? You're back. Yes, let's get right to it. His companion leans forward, ready to jump in. They're impressed that you dove right into the most advanced parts of the theory. Half an hour evaporates and the conversation is still wending its way toward new and unexpected places. But my question is where does the RCM recruit all these hyper-revolutionaries to join this remote viewer's division? Fascinating. Yes, only the detective here would draw a connection between a made-up division of parapsychics and the adult ramblings of a defunct communist mage. But I suppose it makes sense that some common strain of inframaterialist thought would persist in the RCM, even to this day, given its origins. Has it gotten cold in here? Your arms seem to be covered in goose flesh. Well, on that note, I think we're gonna call it an evening. No, wait. Can this really be the end? You feel like you've just gotten to the real stuff. Yes. One of our better discussions lately, on the whole. What do you mean, is that it? You've done the reading, we talked about it. What more do you expect from a reading group? Well, you could always ask, I guess. He probably won't get a better chance, honestly. But it's getting late. So maybe pick the most important question. The question you mean to ask is both very complicated and incredibly simple. The young man waits patiently for you to finish. Yes? Say it. The young man considers your words for a minute. There's something going on in there, but his innermost sanctum is still beyond your reach. The theorists Puncher and Watman, not inframaterialists, but theorists nonetheless, say that communism is a secular version of Perikanasian theology, that it replaces faith in the divine with faith in humanity's future. I have to say, I've never entirely understood what they mean, but I think maybe the answer is in there, somewhere. Nobody said fulfilling the proletariat's historic role would be easy. It demands great faith with no promise of tangible reward. But that doesn't mean we can simply give up. Especially then. And of course, we'll be shooting right back. So young. So unbearably young. Their faces blurred, yet frozen as though in ambrotype. You were never that young, were you? 
I guess you could say we believe it because it's impossible. It's our way of saying we refuse to accept that the world has to remain. Like this. Yes, that's a good way to think of it. Broken, but not irreparable. A thought can be a very powerful thing. That's the whole idea of inframaterialism. His words aren't really directed at you. He's wrestling with himself now. Devon, it's getting pretty late. You're right. We should clean this up and get going. Wait a minute, if you don't mind. We wanted to get your opinion on something. A few little changes we've been thinking about. Nothing too major, I think. We were talking potentially about relaxing some parts of our admissions process. I suppose we have read through most of the inframaterialist canon by this point. Ah, you're right. It probably wouldn't kill us to read more conventional historical materialism. As long as we maintain the appropriate critical distance. There was another thing. We were also debating putting up some posters around town. Though some of us maintain that advertising is an unacceptably bourgeois tactic. That's what makes it so beautiful. The irony is unbeatable. Oh, I like that. We're dismantling the structures of capital with our own tools. Hmm. It does sound pretty cool when you describe it like that. Plus, I've got the perfect place in mind. Put some more coffee on, Uli. We've got a long night ahead of us. We should probably get Cindy in here too. Oh. And gendarme, one last thing. About that question you asked earlier, he reminded me of a certain poem that you might appreciate. Ah, so he has read something besides his books of abstruse theory. It was written by a young communard who was killed on the barricades during the coalition landings. The story goes that he wrote it on the last night of his life, keeping watch from the barricades in the middle of the night. I don't have the whole thing committed to memory but there's a line in it I think about sometimes. In dark times, should the stars also go out? Anyway, good night to you. <laughs>